14, it'll be on the board. I want to unfold this this morning for you a little bit. I can't cover everything. It's not enough time, naturally. Hallelujah. My goodness. Okay, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Say, I am led by the Spirit. If we're not led by the Spirit, let me tell you something, we will goof up. I'm going to say it again. If we're not led by the Spirit, we will goof up. So God has not left us down here by ourselves. He has given us His Holy Spirit. When we received Christ as our personal Savior, our inner man was quickened by the Spirit of God, and we have a brand new recreated Spirit within us, and the Holy Spirit lives within us. And we are to be led by him. And you can always be sure of this. When you're led by the Holy Spirit, it'll always be according to the word of God. So everybody say, I am a son of God. And I'm led by the Spirit. All right, that's why you're here this morning. You were led by the Spirit to come to the house of God in obedience to the word of God. Much I can say about that, but I want to move on. For the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery. To put you once more in bondage to fear. Now, every one of us have had to overcome fear to some degree in certain areas. Is that not, is that not true? Fear of finances, fear of not being accepted, fear of not being loved, fear of, ego, for, fear of being rejected, on and on and on and on. But all of that we know is not from God. So we can resist that. We can refuse that. There's things you can refuse or there's things you can receive. And the trouble is we don't usually know that until we get up uh, maybe 30 or 35, 40 years. We've, uh, we've yielded to all of those negative emotions, all those negative uh, feelings for so long. <coughs> they have become part of our personality. And now we have to come to that place to renew our minds and get all of that out of there and get all of what God wants to put into us where our whole life is changed by the renewing of our mind. But you have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship. Right now we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is busy within our spirit producing sonship. He's bringing us to that realization that we are adopted into the family of God that that spirit of sonship is growing and maturing in us where we will reign and rule in this life through Christ Jesus. Romans uh, chapter 5 verse 17 says that God has given us the gift of righteousness. And what else? I forgot. <laughs> the gift of righteousness and... Very good. Thank you. You forgot it too. All right, you got to help me out. If I forget, you know, y'all got good memories. All right, look, for the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship in the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father. Now, once you come into that area of growth and mature that realize you're sons and daughters of God, you begin to have a different relationship with your heavenly father. You begin to say, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. There is a relationship that you develop with your father, your heavenly father. And that's very, very important to understand that as that relationship is developed with your heavenly father, you come into the understanding, the Holy Spirit does the work in you, that you have that assurance, that, that good feeling that he's my father, he'll never let me down, he, he will direct me, he will guide me, he's given me his spirit, and it's not a spirit of bondage again, it's not a spirit of fear, but it's a spirit of liberty and freedom, and you can come right to the throne of God, right to your heavenly father, and say, I have a father. See, that's a relationship. We're not talking about some mental consent of that, but an experience that you know that he's your heavenly father and he will never let you down. Never. See, you will know that you know that you've been adopted into his family and God takes care of his children. 
because he's a good father. Remember that. Now, Paul is bringing this down here. He's leading somewhere. He says, look at verse 16. The Spirit himself thus testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. Look at that now. The Spirit himself thus testifies together with our own spirit. Now, if this, is, if this is not happening in your life, you need to talk to me because you should have a witness within yourself. The Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit. You are a child of God. The Spirit himself thus testifies together with your own spirit, assuring us, assuring us, assuring us that we are children of God. And with that blessed assurance, strength is there, power is there, encouragement is there. I know who I am. I know who my Heavenly Father is. There's a lot of kids in this world don't know who their mammy is, don't know who their pappy is. And they live in confusion. A lot of people of God don't know their Heavenly Father as their Heavenly Father. He's some God up there. The minute you make a mistake, He's going to hit your head with the, with the baseball bat. That's not our Heavenly Father. That concept needs to get out of your mind and realize that God is a loving God. He's a loving Heavenly Father. He's adopted you into His family. You belong to God. This ain't some fairy tale. This is truth. And when that truth penetrates into the fiber of your being, you come out a different person. I know who I am in Christ Jesus, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him. He will never let me down. Even if I die, so what? I will be with my heavenly Father in heaven. I will have a glorified body. I am an heir of God and a co-heir with Jesus Christ. That means that everything that Jesus has is mine, is yours. Are you listening? I said everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to us. So don't go around talking poor mouth. You are rich. I am rich. Let's go to the next verse. Now, Paul is reassuring us something here that's very important. Verse 17. And if we are his children, are you? Yes. yes, through Christ Jesus. Then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. Wow. Only we must share his sufferings if we are to share his glory. Now, we don't like that part. And we're not talking about um, God putting suffering on us. We're talking about if you walk in the spirit, there's a certain amount of suffering that's going to come our way because people ain't going to just love you so much. Okay? So, now here's what Paul says about that suffering. No, no, go to the next verse. But what of this, of that? But what of that? But what of what? But what of that? But what of what? Of that suffering. What, what about the suffering? Well, what, what's such a big deal about that? Well, what about that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present life, are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. Are you listening? It ain't nothing. It ain't nothing compared to the glory that God has prepared for His children. It's nothing. Don't even get any consideration. It's nothing. Compared to the glory. How many sees that? Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next verse. Now, Paul is, is trying to get us to understand some things here. For the creation, nature was, for even the whole creation, all nature waits 
expectantly longs earnestly for God's sons, that's us, to be made known, waits for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship. Let's go over that again now. For even the whole creation, all right, what is the, let's identify the, the whole creation. Lions, animals, all of those wild animals in Africa killing one another and eating one another for dinner. How many understand that? All creation, the whole creation, all nature, the corruption we see all around us, this earth, it's dying every day. And what are they longing for? They're longing earnestly for God's sons, that's us, to be made known, wait, they wait. It's waiting for the, why are they, why is it waiting? Well, we'll find out. Turn to the next verse. Waiting for us to experience our sonship. Next verse, Charles, 20. For the creation or nature was subjected to frailty, to, to futility, condemned to fluceration, not because of some intention, intentional fault on its part. In other words, nature didn't bring this on itself. Okay? Lions eating uh, little deer and killing and, and our dogs, they're dying too. My dog just died not too long ago. All that is part of the old creation. And it wasn't the dog's fault. It was put on our dog by, all the way back to the garden, to Adam. And God had to punish Adam by cursing the earth. And when the earth was cursed, by God because of Adam's sin, then we see what's happening in nature today. Devouring one another, lost man, devouring one another, killing one another, all of that, sickness, all of that is due. Go all the way back to Adam. God ain't putting that on nobody. It comes from one man's disobedience, notice what it says, but by the will of him who so subjected it, yet with the hope, all right? There is hope. What do you mean hope, Paul? Hope of something better that's going to come along the way. <clears throat> All creation didn't do this because they did something bad. No, it was, they were subjected to it because of what Adam did, and God had to punish Adam and the earth because Adam was the, in a sense, the Adam... Adam was actually the, the steward of the earth. Uh, in Psalms 116, it says that the heavens belong to God, but the earth belongs to the sons of men. And why does a lot of things happen down here? Because man is not taking his place ruling and reigning with Christ. Are you listening? A lot of things in our, all of our lives we are suffering because we have not ruled and reigned with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, and we have to suffer the consequence. It is not God doing it. It's man doing it. It's up to man. Why, why do we have wars? <laughs> Read the book of James. James will tell you. Okay? Now, let's move on here a little bit. All right, let's go to the next one. That nature, cre creation itself, will be set free. Now, notice this. Nature itself, creation itself, all the animals, all the world, things that we see today, the briars, the, the weeds that grow in the garden, all of that kind of stuff, all that will disappear, and it will be set free from its bondage to decay and corruption have you noticed that your, the house that you lived in and you bought it 40 years ago, you got any rotten boards on it? <laughs> How many's got rotten boards on their old house, huh? What, what's happening? It, it's decaying. It, it, huh? Yeah, all that's due to the fall. Yeah. 
Have you noticed you bought a car 40 years ago and it was, it was beautifully red and now it's rusty? <laughs> That's all part of that decaying effect on the earth yet. It has not been removed yet. Our bodies have not been glorified yet. It is still subject to germs and uh, different things that can make us sick. Okay? I don't have time to go into it in all detail, but you get the gist. Notice what it says, and decay and corruption and gain and entrance into the glorious freedom of God's children. Let's move to the next verse. We know that the whole creation, every animal, regardless of what, of irrational creatures have been mourning, mourning, let's go, you're mowing together, mourning together in the pains of labor until now, right now. Animal kingdoms, they know. Go to the next verse. And not only crea the creation, but we ourselves too. Notice what it says. And not only the creation, but we ourselves too are doing what? Groaning and moaning. Who have and, who have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit a foretaste of the blissful things to come, now, that's in the future, grown inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our, what? Bodies from sensuality and the grave, which will reveal our adoption, our manifestation as God's sons. So all of this will be going on until the resurrection, until uh, we, as uh, children of God, get our resurrected bodies. And when that happens, the curse will be lifted off this earth. Three things I've said in the past that will be redeemed. Our spirit, our bodies, and this earth. I'm going to say that again. Our spirit, the spirit of man, the body of man, and the earth will be redeemed. But how many of you know we don't see the earth redeemed yet, and we don't see these bodies redeemed? Is your body redeemed? No. no, but it will be. That's our hope. That's our hope. Okay, let's go to the next. For in this hope, in this hope, what do you mean this hope? This hope of our resurrection, this hope of our glorified bodies, this hope we were saved. But hope the object of which is seen is not hope. For, ho for how can one hope for what he already sees? So we don't already see it. And if we did, it wouldn't be hope. It would be reality. Do you see that? It would be reality. But we still hope for it. Okay? All right, go to the next verse. But if we hope for what is still unseen. Now, it's unseen. You don't see your bodies redeemed yet. Unseen by us, we wait for it with patience and exposure. So we're waiting on something. What are we waiting on? Our bodies to be glorified. How many sees it? I'm not losing you, Emma. How many sees it? How many don't see it? All right, I'm making it as clear as I can. So we have a hope. And we wait for it. And what is that hope? The hope of our glorified bodies. And when that happens, all of nature will be set free from that bondage of corruption and decay. So we have a great hope. We have a great expectation of what God has prepared for us. Let's go to the next verse now. So, too, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weaknesses. Now, in this fallen state that our bodies are in, there's a certain amount of weakness that we all have in these bodies, especially as you get older. Some of you young folks don't believe that, but just hang around. But God said, but listen. Listen. I've given you the Holy Spirit. And he will help and aid you to bear up under that weakness of your old nature. 
the old unrenewed body, the body that's go, decaying. Have you looked in the mirror lately? How many's looked in the mirror lately? How, how, how many looks like you might be going down a little bit? <laughs> What, what does the girls do this for? Oh, what are they trying to cover up? Huh? <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it, girls, you know. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I've read the Bible. But the good news is, one day you won't have to. You won't have to do that. You have a glorified body. You'll look good 24-7. In a glorified body. See, this is the hope that we have. How many wake up in the morning and groan just a little bit? Look at that. Michelle, you have to talk to the congregation and wake it up in the morning, groaning in the morning. Look at Bill's got both hands up. Oh, it's morning already. That's only temporary. But the things you see are only temporary. The things you don't see are eternal. The outer man is decaying day by day, but the inner man is being renewed day by day. That's why Paul says, I don't look at the outer man of anybody anymore because I can't hardly stand it. Anyway, <laughs> I never thought of it that way. <clears throat> but he looks at the inner man that's been regenerated, born again, and is being conformed into the image of the Son of God. So this old house fading away, but that's all right. God's got it all covered. There's a day in which you will have a brand new resurrected body. And all nature and all the creatures, they'll be able to sit down and eat together. They won't be eating one another. They'll be eating straw or whatever they eat, grass, but they won't be eating one another. Have you ever seen a big... Uh, tiger run after a little deer. Coop. Yum, 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 yum. He's gone. That won't happen no more. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Because all of that bondage will be lifted. And the sons of God have been manifested to reign and rule with Christ on this earth for a thousand years. So we've got a great hope. All right, let's, let's go here. So two, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weaknesses, for we do not know what prayer to offer. How can, nor how to offer it worthily as we ought, but the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. So here we are, even though you are in this body and it's decaying, God says, but you know, I've given you my Holy Spirit and he knows exactly what to pray for and you put your faith in the Holy Spirit and you know he'll pray for you and he'll pray what uh, you need. So you're not down here all alone, even though you are decaying and getting wrinkled up. Some of you won't admit it, but those things you see in the mirror, they're really wrinkles, okay? <laughs> you might as well face it. Don't you worry about it. God knows what you need. He's giving you his Holy Spirit. And in his Holy Spirit is all the power that we need to make it through these last days that we're living in now. 
I'm almost 82, and I can testify it is the Spirit of God that moves and motivates me and strengthens me and causes me to get up in the morning without moaning and without groaning, but praising God even in my affliction. The psalmist says, I will praise the Lord. That's a mouthful. I say, this isn't, honey, what you got to say, babe? She says, praise the Lord. Atta girl, just keep praising him, honey. All right, let's go to the next one. Now, we're talking about something that's important. And God's not left us here to have to suffer, even though we're getting up in years. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his, what his intent is. Because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints according to and in harmony with God's will. So we got somebody living in us who intercedes and prays to the Father on our behalf. And he knows what to ask the Father. He knows how to pray. And he'll pray for us and sustain us in our old age. And all of God's people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of you young folks don't know what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> you get older, you find out. All right, let's go to the next one. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, in our labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good to and for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. So what if we are growing old? So what if these old bodies don't just ain't as limber as they used to be? We got the Holy Spirit living in us. We got all the power of God living in us. It, the, 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 the power of God is not of the vessel that's fading away. So let it fade away. God's got a brand new vessel for us to live in one day. So why hang on to the old house? We don't, you know, you got three score and ten, and you might live to be 80. And you'll just have, that's okay, I won't go into that. But look what it says. Look what it says. We are assured and know that God being a partner in our labor, are fitting into a plan. All of this is fitting into a plan. Whatever you're going through, it's fitting into a plan for good. For those that love the Lord and call according to his purpose. Next verse. For those whom he foreknew, and that's us, before the foundation of the world, of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, before you even came on this earth, before you even got that body. He knew you. He loved you. He planned for you. He also des destined from the beginning for ordaining them, that's us, to be molded into the image of his son and share inwardly his likeness that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. I want to say something here. How many has ever planted a garden? All right. The outward shell, you know the outward shell that contains the, the life that's in, in there? How many saves the outer shell? <laughs> this is the outer shell. What's inside is what God sees. God does not look outwardly. He looks inwardly. And let me tell you something. Unless a seed fall in the ground and die, it'll bite alone. But if it dies, hallelujah, it brings forth new branches, new fruit, newness of life. That's just the way it works. And so you might as well gear in your mind that what you're looking in the mirror is only going to be around a little longer. 
Aren't you glad? I think Mrs. James says, the only one says yes. You just, you rest of you just hold on. I'll guarantee I know what I'm talking about. I think it was a year ago I hollered out, Susan! Yeah, what is it, honey? What is it? Who's that in the mirror? That's you. That ain't me. That don't even look like me, does it, Roy? No, I see Roy said no. <laughs> How many understand what I'm talking about? How many things since you since you, t today and, and 20 years ago you look different? Let me see your hand, let's see your faces. Look at everybody. Some of you just ain't going to admit it, I know. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. You're not fooling this old man. All right, look. He knew us. Mo he's, God's got a plan. See, we, we come into this life, we're going to work our plans. No, wait a minute. God's plan is to conform us into the image of the Son of God. And the outer shell has to break loose, and the inner man come forth. And that's the plan of God. And you can't alter that. So these old bodies are only for a little while. For the things that we see are temporary, Roy. Now you look good right now. I can just see another 30 years. Roy, is that you, boy? Speak to me, son. So he, he's good looking, isn't he, huh? Uh, he's, he's like, you know, he's, yeah, he's like the rest of you guys. He's good looking. <laughs> oh, he, he's going to change, son. <laughs> we'll pray for you, though. <laughs> now, notice, molded into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, and share inwardly his likeness. His, what am I going to look like? You're going to look like Jesus. You're going to look like Jesus. That's God's plan. And share inwardly his likeness that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. And when God lines up all of his kids by the thousand, they'll all look like Jesus. I thought that was Brother Bob. No, that's Jesus. We're all going to be molded into the image of Jesus. Woo! Next. And those whom he thus foreordained, that's us, he also called. He called us. And those whom he called, he also justified. We are fully justified, quitted, made righteous. You don't have to strive for that. It's done. It's finished. It's complete. That's something he has done for you. He is the one that did it. He's the one that's doing it. He is conforming every one of us into the image of the Son of God. So quit fighting God and just be conformed. And quit bitching about the problem you might be in. Oh, Bob, behave yourself. I'm trying. Don't, don't leave, Spencer. <laughs> don't leave. Lock the door for me back there. I'm just getting wound up. <clears throat> now look at that. I right, just finished that. Acquitted, made righteous, putting them into right standing with God himself. We are in right standing with God right now. Right now, something he did for us. You can't work in it. You can't buy into the kingdom of God. This is what he did before the foundation of the world. He chose us to be conformed into the image of the Son of the living God. You might as well receive it and accept it and bless him for it. And those who he justified, that means just as if you've never sinned. Don't you ever doubt God's love. Where's my, where's my paddle at? Right here. Run. 
Don't you ever doubt God's love. You can't be loved no more than you are right now. And once that love penetrates into the fiber of your inner being, perfect love casts out fear. Fear of not being accepted. Fear, I've got to do this to be accepted. No, you don't. God chose you. You didn't do a thing. He chose you before the foundation of the world to be his child. And now that I know that, by his grace and mercy, by the power of the Holy Ghost, I'll live for him. I'll bring pleasure to him in my life. All right, look at what it says. He also glorified. No, oh my goodness. Putting them in, into right standing with himself and those whom he justified, which is us, he also glorified, raising them to a heavenly dignity and condition or state of being. Now go back to what we've been talking about. As we follow those scriptures back, what we were reading in Rome, at Romans, and we're coming on down the line here. Now here we have within us the image of the Son of God, and he is not going to leave you in that old body. He is not going to leave you in that old body. I know you think you look pretty good, and you do. I ain't kicking that. But come back in another 30 years, let's take a look at you. <laughs> You'll be saying, what was that sermon you preached about 30 years ago, Brother Bob? <laughs> yes, you are on the outward. Day by day, yes, you are passing away. But inwardly, you're being renewed day by day into the very image of the Son of the living God. And that's something you can't do, but that's something you can let Him do, and He will do it. Because when it's all over and finished, you're going to walk and you're going to look just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. Many brethren. Look at that. Raising them to a heavenly dignity and condition of... Or state of being. Whew. Look at that Roy. He's got his glorified body walking on the ceiling. Roy, you come down from here right now. Behave yourself. <laughs> Don't swing on that chandelier. <laughs> All right, the next verse. What then shall we say to all this? What, what have you guys got to say to all of this? Huh? Huh? What, what, what do you got to say about all this? Huh? If God be for you, who's going to be against you? Who can be our foe? If God is on our side, huh? God's on our side. See, we have to understand what God has done. This ain't some f fantasy tale. This ain't some uh, tale that some witch uh, uh, drummed up. This is something God that created the heavens and the earth. God created all of us. God had a plan for us. He adopted us into his family. And he is sharing his wealth with us. Heirs of Christ and co-heirs with God. Everything that God has belongs to you. To you. To you, to you, it belongs to every one of his children. It's ours. We don't have to grasp for it. We don't have to try to educate for it. No, he just gives it to us. Why, Lord? Because that's love. Love gives. Love saves. Love edifies. Love is not selfish. And God is love. I can just see some of you now. Here's a million dollars. Oh, I couldn't take that. I'm, I'm not worthy. 
excuse me, son. I'm not worthy either, but I got it. <laughs> Ain't got nothing to do with your worthiness. Ain't got nothing to do with whatever, however, upside down, forward. Has nothing to do with it. It's God's love. It's God's gift to man. Eternal life is a gift from God. Our bodies will be a gift from God. It's God. You read the Bible from the beginning. It's God. It's God. It's God. It's God. It's God that sanctifies us. It's God that justifies us. It's God that's raising us from the dead. It's God who takes care of us. It's God that strengthens us. It's God that heals us. It's God that redeems us. It's God that justifies us. It's God who loves us. It's God. It's God. And even though now... We are in these little bodies here because of Adam's sin. God is changing everything like it never happened. And it won't even be in a memory anymore. All of a sudden, there we are where we're supposed to be with our Heavenly Father. And we look back and we say, what was all the fuss about anyway? God had it all taken care of. Let's read on. We've got five more minutes. I'm going to let you go. Next verse. He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, talking about God the Father, but gave him up for Bob and Roy and all of us, will he not also with him, that is with Christ, freely and graciously give us all other things? but I'm not good enough. Throw that in the trash can. Ain't got nothing to do with God's grace and love. Next verse. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? That's us. When it is God who justifies, that is who puts us in right relation to himself. How did you get into right relationship with God, by the way? He did it. Who shall come forward and accuse or impeach those whom God has chosen? Will God, who acquits us? The question is, no, God won't. Next. Who is there to condemn us? Will Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who died, or rather who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, actually pleading as he intercedes for us. So we have our heavenly, we have Jesus up there interceding. Next. Who shall ever separate us from Christ's love? Shall suffering? No. Affliction? No. Tribulation? No. Calamity? No. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Or hunger? No. Or destitution? No. Or pearl? No. Or sword? No. Next. Even as it is written, for thy sake we are put to death all the day long. That's Paul talking, and he's putting to death uh, and uh, for us. We are regarded and counted as sheep for the slaughter. But the next, yet amidst all these things, we are more than conquerors and gain a surpassing victory through him who loved us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We walk out of this place victorious. We thank you for what Christ has done, and we give you the honor and the glory and the praise. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you. Turn to somebody and tell them what's oh, what you're going to do.